Assalamu alaikum and welcome back once again to Today in African History with Baba Shaka. I'm Baba Shaka and today is February 24th, 2021. And today I want to take a look at an, an occurrence, an, an event that I think and maybe a lot of um, other people also believe was one of the very important events of the 20th century in our history as a collective people. And that is the first Pan-African Conference, which was held in London from July 23rd to July 25th in the year 1900, just prior to the Paris Exhibition in 1900 in order to allow tourists of African descent to attend both events. Now, organized primarily by the Trinidadian barrister, Henry Sylvester Williams, it took place in Westminster Town Hall, which is now called Caxton Hall, and was attended by 37 delegates from about and about 10 other participants and observers from Africa, the West Indies, the U.S., and the U.K., including Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was the youngest delegate, John Alcindor, mm -hmm. Dabdenai Naoroji, I hope I pronounced that correctly, John Archer, Henry Francis Downing, and W.E.B. Du Bois, with Bishop Alexander Walters of the A.M.E. Zion Church taking the chair. Du Bois played a leading role drafting a letter Address to the nations of the world, to European leaders appealing to them to struggle against racism, to grant the colonies in Africa and the West Indies the right to self-government, and demanding political and other rights for African in America. On the 24th of September, 1897, Henry Sylvester Williams had been instrumental in founding the African Association in response to the European partition of Africa that followed the 1884-1885 Congress in Berlin. The formation of the association marked an early stage in the development of the anti-colonialist movement and was established to encourage the unity of Africans and people of African descent, particularly in the territories of the British Empire. Concerning itself with injustices in Britain's African and Caribbean colonies, in March 1898, the association issued a circular calling for a Pan-African conference. Booker T. Washington, who had been traveling in the UK in the summer of 1899, wrote a letter to the African-American newspapers. I quote, In connection with the assembling of so many Negroes in London from different parts of the world, a very important movement has just been put up, upon foot. Put upon foot, I like that term. It is known as the Pan-African Conference. Representatives from Africa, the West Indian Islands, and other parts of the world asked me to meet them a few days ago with a view of making a preliminary program for this conference. And we had a most interesting meeting. It is surprising to see the strong intellectual mold which many of these Africans and West Indians possess. Not sure why that was surprising. The object and character of the Pan-African Conference is best told in the words of the resolution, which was adopted at the meeting reference to. In view of the widespread ignorance which is prevalent in England about the treatment of native races under European and American rule, the African Association, which consists of members of the race resident in England and which has been in existence for nearly two years, have resolved during the Paris Exposition of 1900, which many representatives of the race may be visiting, to hold a conference in London in the month of May of the said year in order to take steps to influence public opinion on existing proceedings and conditions affecting the welfare of the natives in various parts of Africa, the West Indies, and the United States. The resolution is signed by Mr. H. Mason Joseph, President, Mr. H. Sylvester Williams as Honorable Secretary. The Honorable Secretary will be pleased to hear from Representative who are desirous of attending at an early date. He may be addressed at Common House Grays in London, WC. I don't know what WC is. When the first Pan-African Conference opened on Monday, the July 23rd, 1900, in London's Westminster Hall, Bishop Alexander Walters, in his opening address, The Trials and Tribulations of the Colored Race in America, noted that, quote, for the first time in history, Black people had gathered from all parts of the globe to discuss and improve the condition of their race, to assert their rights, and organize so that they might take an equal place among nations, unquote. The Bishop of London, Mandel Creighton, gave his speech of welcome, referring to the benefits of self-government, 
which Britain must confer on other races as soon as possible, unquote. Speakers over the three days addressed a variety of aspects of racial discrimination. Among the papers delivered were conditions favoring a high standard of African humanity, and that was delivered by C.W. French of St. Kitts, the preservation of racial equality, that was delivered by Anna H. Jones from Kansas City, Missouri, the necessary concord to be established between native races and European colonialists, delivered by Benita Sylvain, who was the, the Haitian aide-de-camp to the Ethiopian emperor, Haile Selassie. Then there was the Negro problem in America, which was delivered by Anna J. Cooper from Washington, D.C. The progress of our people, delivered by John E. Quinlan of St. Lucia. And Africa, the Sphinx of History in Light of Unsolved Problems. And that was delivered by D.E. Tobias from the United States. Other topics included Richard Phipps' complaint of discrimination against black people in Trinidad, in the Trinidadian civil service, and an attack by William Meyer, a medical student at Edinburgh University, on pseudoscientific racism. Discussions followed in the presentation of the papers, and on the last day, George James Christian, a law student from Dominica, led a discussion on the subject, organized plunder and the human progress have made our race their battlefield, saying that in the past, Africans have been kidnapped from their land, and in South Africa and Rhodesia, slavery is being revived in the form of forced labor. The conference culminated in the conversion of the African Association, which was formed, as I said before, by Sylvester Williams in 1897, into the Pan-African Association and the implementation of a unanimously adopted address to the nations of the world sent to various heads of state where people of African descent were living and suffering oppression. The address implored the United States and the imperial European nations to, quote, acknowledge and protect the rights of people of African descent, unquote, and to respect the integrity and independence of the, quote, free Negro states of Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia, Liberia, Haiti, etc. And it was signed by Walters, president of the Pan-African Association, the Canadian, Reverend Henry B. Brown, who was vice president, um, Henry Sylvester Williams as general secretary, and Du Bois, who served as chairman of the committee on the address. The document contained the phrase, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, unquote, which Du Bois would use three years later in the forethought of his book, The Souls of Black Folks. If you have not read The Souls of Black Folks, I suggest that you do so as quickly as possible. In September, the delegates petitioned Queen Victoria through the British government to look into the treatment of Africans in South Africa and Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, including specified acts of injustice perpetrated by whites there, namely, one, the degraded and illegal compound system of labor in vogue in Kimberley and Rhodesia, two, the so-called indentured, i.e., the legalized bondage of African men, women, and children to white colonialists. Three, the system of compulsory labor in public works. Four, the, the pass or docket system used for people of color. Five, local bylaws tending to segregate and degrade Africans, such as the curfew, the denial of Africans of the youth of footpaths, and the use of sev separate public conveyances. Six, difficulties in acquiring real property. We couldn't even buy property in our own country. And seven, difficulties in obtaining the franchise, in obtaining the right to vote. The response eventually received by Sylvester Williams on January 17, 1901 stated, quote, Sir, I am directed by Mr. Secretary Chamberlain to state that he has received the Queen's command to inform you that the memorial of the Pan-African Conference requesting the situation of the native races in South Africa has been laid before Her Majesty and that she was graciously pleased to command him to return an answer to it on behalf of her government. Two, Mr. Chamberlain accordingly desires to assure the members of the Pan-African Conference that it's settling the lines on which the administration of the conquered territories is to be conducted. Her Majesty's government will not overlook the interests and welfare of the native races. Days later, Victoria responded more personally, instructing her private secretary, Arthur Big, to write 
which he did on the 21st of January, the day before the Queen died. Although the specific injustices in South Africa continued for some time, the conference brought them to the attention of the world. The conference was reported in major British newspapers, including the Times and the Westminster Gazette, which commented that it, quote, marks the initiation of a remarkable movement in history. The Negro is at last awake to the potentialities of his future, unquote. And quoted Williams as saying, our object now is to secure throughout the world the same facilities and privileges for the black as the white man enjoys. On Monday, the 23rd of July, the conference was invited to a five o'clock tea given by the Reform Cobden Club of London in honor of the delegates at its, at its headquarters at St. Ermes Hotel, one of the most elegant in the city. Several members of parliament and other notables were present. Mm. The splendid repast was served and for two hours, the delegates were delightfully entertained by the members and friends of the club. <laughs> on at five o'clock on Tuesday, a tea, another tea was given in our honor by the late Dr. Creighton, Lord Bishop of London, at his stately palace in Fulham, which has been occupied by the bishops of London since the 15th century. On our arrival at the palace, we found his lordship and one or two other bishops with their wives and daughters waiting to greet us after a magnificent repast had been served, we were conducted through the extensive grounds which surround the palace." Unquote. Through the kindness of Mr. Clark, a member of parliament, we were invited to tea on Wednesday, there's a lot of tea, at five o'clock on the terrace of parliament. After the tea, get this, after the tea, the male members of our party were admitted to the House of Commons. The female members had to wait outside, which is considered quite an honor indeed to visit to the House of Parliament and tea on the terrace was the crowning honor of this series. Great credit is due our genial secretary, Mr. H. Sylvester Williams for these social functions. It appears they had a good time. Miss Catherine MP of London said she was glad to come in contact with the class of Negroes that composed the Pan-African Conference and wish that the best and most cultured would visit England and meet her citizens of noble birth. That the adverse opinions which had been created against them in some quarters of late by the enemies might be changed. After the conference ended, Williams set up branches of Pan-African associations in Jamaica, Trinidad, and the USA. He also launched a short-lived journal, the Pan-African, in October of 1901. Although plans for the association to meet every two years failed, the 1900 conference encouraged the development of the Pan-African Congress. As Dr. Tony Martin noted, quote, at least three of the Caribbean delegates later emigrated to Africa. George Christian of Dominica became a successful lawyer and legislator in the Gold Coast, which of course is today Ghana, where he was a member of the Legislative Council from 1920 to 1940. Richard E. Phipps, the Trinidad barrister, returned home after the conference and emigrated to the Gold Coast, Ghana, in 1911. He remained there until his death around 1926. Williams himself lived in South Africa from 1903 to 1904 and again in 1910 and died in Trinidad in 1911. Under the Pan-African Congress banner, a series of gatherings subsequently took place in 1919 in Paris, 1921 in London, 1923 again in London, 1927 in New York City, 1945 in Manchester, England, 1974 in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and 1994 in Kampala, Uganda, to address the issues facing Africa as a result of European colonization. A centenary commemorative event was held in London on the 25th of July, 2000 attended by descendants of some of the delegates at the original conference, as well as the descendants of delegates at the 1945 Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester. Now, this report was put together by a very brilliant scholar by the name of Elizabeth. Uh, we'll get her name here. I thought this was a very good report. Excellent. Her name is Elizabeth Richards. Okay? And I'm going to put her name and the title of her work down in the comments section. I'm also going to um, put the, the book 
the souls of black folk um by w e boys that is a common session and i suggest to get further knowledge on the, on this conference and on um w b the boys work that you read his book and also follow up and any work done by elizabeth richards all right once again i would like to give a special shout out to president baba mosi and the sisters and brothers of the Woodson Banneka Jackson Bay Division number 330 UNIA ACL Rehabilitating Committee that's the Universal Negro Improvement Association originally founded by the late great Marcus Messiah Garvey and the African Communities League who are helping to promote these daily lessons on their various fa um Facebook pages because our goals are the same and that is to enlighten African people to our glorious path I also like to give a special another special shout out to my friend and a very good friend and fraternity brother Antonio Evans who is always um supporting this program and is pushing me to keep it going and to do better I, um thank you for your encouragement brother Antonio okay for those of you who have already subscribed we thank you as I said say every day we cannot thank you enough for those of you who have not yet subscribed, we urge you to do so. Uh, just hit that subscribe button and become a member of the family. For the subscribers and, and non-subscribers, we also encourage you to give us your comments. Tell us your likes, your dislikes, uh, your suggestions. Also, share, especially with the young amongst us. So until tomorrow, inshallah, this is Baba Shaka with Today in African History. Masalam.